Welcome to Smithwell Stadium here in Jackson, Mississippi. Game two of the Class 4A Championships here along the MHSAA Network. I'm Josh West. So glad to have you along with us. A Purvis team, compliments of a 5-3 win in game one, remaining undefeated in these playoffs, have now moved to 25-4 and four on the year, taking on a Lewisburg team on the brink of elimination, coming in now 24-11. They had that 11-game winning streak snapped in game one on Wednesday. You look at this Purvis Tornado starting lineup, Philip Lott, Hunt Hunter Holcomb, Logan Farrell, and then followed by Lambeth, McElhenney and Aiken, followed by Kitchens, Smith, and Roseberry. So it's a lineup that is very familiar to Tornado fans. Nothing really has changed since game one. Just pretty much pitching changes, and then the Lewisburg defense, they make a change at shortstop. You look at the way their lineup shakes out, very similar to game one. Haney, Martin, Densford. Densford, who is on the mound, goes to short. Lindsay's on the bump for this Patriot team. Then Lloyd, Todd, and Brown, Hunter Wilson, Chris Taylor, Aaron Baker round out this lineup. But again, there is one uh, absence from that lineup, and that was Kobe Busby. Busby struggled with some errors early in that game. Remember the four-run, four-hit bottom of the first inning that really sparked Purvis. That was 80% of their offense, and there were two errors in that bottom of the first inning that aided in that discussion. So Purvis would love to pick up where they left off in game one, this time batting in the top of the first inning as the road team here in this game two. Purvis in their gray unis with the purple trimmed in gold for Lewisburg. They're in their home white and will be batting in the bottom of the first inning. Lewisburg going to send Jonathan Lindsay to the mound a young man who has been very solid throughout this postseason run, a record of 8-1 and one on this season, an earned run average of 2.11, and will be glancing at his numbers throughout this inning. And so this game will be a battle of left-handers. Chase Smith, the left-handed young man, the senior, will go up for Purvis. A senior against a sophomore, but it's... Nothing new for this Patriot team to have sophomores factoring into the equation. A first pitch that came in nearly on the knees of Lott, a called strike, and we're underway here in the top of the first inning. Blazing temperatures, just balmy conditions, so to speak, because there is no wind moving in this ballpark. If you're in the sun, if you're on that turf, it is toasty warm. And so the teams really have no excuse not to be loose in this one other than the fact there's a state championship on the line for Purvis. They're looking for their third under Coach Farlow and looking to pick up their first championship since going back-to-back -back in 3A in 04 and 05. For Lewisburg, this is their first ever appearance in a state championship in any of the major sports and trying to extend their stay and Trying to force game three as this pitch is slapped down the left field line. It's going to get down fair, get past the defender in left, go all the way to the wall. And so that was Brown who went diving for it, a stand-up triple for Phillip Lott. And the Purvis crowd is already working themselves into a lather. So here comes Hunter Holcomb, the catcher, the hero in the walk-off hit, what turned out to be the walk-off hit against West Lauderdale. That clinched the berth in this championship game. First pitch by Lindsey in for a strike. So the triple has the Tornadoes off and moving here in this first inning. Here's the lefty dealing, and that one is down low, the count evens. Working from the stretch is Lindsay. Fought off that time by Holcomb. Now behind in the count of ball and two strikes. You look at Lindsay's numbers, his 18th appearance this afternoon for Lindsay, making his 11th start of this season. Having worked in 56 and a third of an inning, opponents bat just 242 against him. He's given up 24 runs, 17 earned on 56 hits as the 1 2 offering trying to get Holcomb to chase just misses, and the count evens up. T 
Two balls and two strikes. Pitch on the way. Popped up. This one straight back and everybody kind of running for cover and that one goes right in to the tornado dugout. So just a very high, very dramatic strike and the count stays at two and two. Holcomb was one for four with the run scored in that first game, reached on a fielder's choice after the lot single. Both Lott and Holcomb scored in that bottom of the first of game one. The pitch, that one around his shoelaces and a swing and a miss. And there is one away here in the inning. So it brings up Logan Farrell, the shortstop. With a runner at third base. Just underway here in game two of this 4A title series. Lewisburg will counter with Lyle Haney, Rudy Martin, Tanner Densford. One, two, three in the home half of the first inning at the plate. As the first pitch registers for ball one. Purvis, a one game to done lead, trying to wrap this thing up here. This afternoon, here's one hit on the nose in a right field. Drifting back, though, to put it away is Chris Taylor, but it scores a run as tagging up and coming in from third is Phillip Lott. Logan Farrell gets credit for a sacrifice fly, and Purvis gets right back to where they have been throughout this entire series, and that is in that catbird seat in the lead. They have not trailed in this series. It's gotten close. Took game one by a score of five to three. Led five to nothing late in that ball game. Three runs in the top of the sixth inning for Lewisburg. But Logan Farrell flies out to right field. The sack fly brings in that RBI. He had a sacrifice bunt to advance runners in the first inning of game one. Lloyd Lambus stands in, having fouled off the first pitch. Behind in the count, nothing with one, with two outs and the bases empty as the pitch comes in and misses low, and the count evens at a ball and a strike for Lloyd Lambus, the 347 hitter on this season. Lambus, two for three with a run scored and a run batted in in game one. Now looking for more, just gets a piece of that one, but basically swung through it and now down to his final strike a ball two strikes one two offering this one hit on the nose this will get down and loop in for a base hit so a two out single for Lambeth the hit his 28th of the season and Lambeth aborted first base going back to game one Eight came to the plate in the bottom of the first inning. John Ross McElhenney, the left fielder, represents the fifth here in game two. McElhenney was one for three in game one with a run and a run batted in, run scored and a run batted in. Now ahead in the count of ball and no strikes. Six of the eight hits were in the top five spots in the lineup. Ground ball here to second base, the underhand flip with Densford covering the bag, and that'll end the inning. So nice teamwork, Haney and Densford team up for the force. McElhaney grounds into a fielder's choice to end the inning. Lambeth forced out four to six, and we have a half a frame in the books. So one run on two hits, no errors, and one left on base. The sack fly by Logan Farrell plates Phillip Lott, and we transition to the bottom of the first inning. Let's go ahead and take a look at how the defense will set up for Purvis here in the bottom of the first inning. Defensively, McElhenney will be in left, Lott in center, Kitchens in right, Roseberry will be at third, Farrell over at short, Aiken is at second, Lambeth at first, and Holcomb behind the plate. 
And then on the mound will be Chase Smith. Smith, the senior left-hander, upper 70s, low 80s guy, going to work in a changeup and a curveball, where it's a two-seam and a four-seam fastball, guy that's not going to overpower you, but a guy that just plays with tons of confidence. What we're seeing here from Lindsey, we're seeing him just needing to settle in. He's a guy that works so many different things. And we saw him face five in that top of the first. He mixes up the fastball, the changeup, even a, a a slurve, as they call it, that slider curve hybrid. And he also works a two-seam, four-seam fastball. Batting order for Lewisburg will look like this. Lowell Haney, the second baseman, will lead things off. Rudy Martin, the center fielder, bats second. Tanner Dents for the shortstop, bats third. Followed by Tanner Lloyd, Dalton Todd, and Gay Brown. Hunter Wilson is a DH for Lindsey. And then Chris Taylor and Aaron Baker. So one to nothing Purvis heading into the home half of the first inning here at Smithwell Stadium. So glad to have you along here on day three of these championships already. We know we will have a day five. That is because in the 1A title series, it was Greenville St. Joe bouncing back and getting a win. It was what turned out to be an 11 to eight win for Greenville St. Joe over Nanawoya, there were 19 runs, 16 hits, but get this, 13 errors. And a game that took nearly two and a half hours. Everybody here hustled to get this game going on time. And so it's worked out well. But dramatics will turn even more so on Monday at a game time to be determined. So here comes Lal Haney. As he stands in and takes a big swing at one. Haney and Martin, the two guys at the top of the lineup, have been the clutch driving forces for this Lewisburg offense, not only in this series that sparked a sixth inning, top of the sixth inning rally, but throughout this postseason, go back to game three of the North Finals against Lafayette, and those two combined to go six for ten. Go back a little bit more, go back into the North Semis where Haney went three for five with four RBI, a pair of doubles in a win against Cleveland. So these guys, more than table setters, they can do it with guys on base as well as Haney fights off a one-two pitch to stay alive. But it's so critical for the Patriots to get something going early. It wasn't until the sixth inning that they we're able to scratch across runs in game one. Here's the one-two pitch, just missed. Two and two. Good looking pitch that time from Chase Smith, the senior. As Smith offers a pie and away. Haney being disciplined. Very impressive to see what this Patriot team has done under head coach Rusty Cagle because they have only three seniors on this roster. Payoff pitch, ball four. Haney draws a leadoff walk. And after being behind in the hole, a ball and two strikes, it makes that even a touch more impressive. Haney went two for three in game number one. And so now he's aboard and here comes Martin, Rudy Martin, he as well. When, uh, well, one for three, rather, with a run batted in and a run scored. So they were definitely indeed productive. That hit a single that drove in a run in that sixth inning. A single to walk, a pair of strikeouts. But Haney, instead of striking out looking like he didn't gain one, draws a walk, takes a big lead at first. Here's the pitch. And the count is now two balls and no strikes to Rudy Martin. Over at first base where Lambeth is holding the runner, Haney playing a little game of, I don't know, a little game of dare over there at first base. When he makes the move to the plate, Haney still takes a couple steps back to first. So that lead just a little bit more comfortable than he is willing to just sit there on a pitch to the plate. 
but a mammoth lead by Haney at first. Takes a couple of steps, slide steps as if he were guarding somebody in basketball towards the bag on another pitch that misses. So Smith struggling to find the zone here and obviously with an eye on the runner. Purvis gets a Phillip Lott triple, then a sacrifice fly by Logan Farrell. Here's a throw on a throw over, and again, Haney got too far off the bag. The throw up towards second, and they get the runner. It's going to be tough, tough for these runners as now the umpire coming out to talk to Smith, and I believe they have called a balk, and they have. They have called a balk, and they're going to put the runner back at second base. I was glancing down at my notes at the exact time Haney broke, right when the throw went to first and then quickly, swiftly, to Farrell the shortstop covering it second for the tag out, but the, a balk has been called against Smith. So now a runner at scoring position, and now we'll see what this does here, though, to Smith. The pitch. It's in there for a strike. Scoreboard shows two and one. I called three and oh. We've got three and one on the monitor here. And so I'd love to see home plate umpire Jackie Caldwell hold up some fingers for us. There were so many throws to first, it kind of threw off our rhythm. And that was indeed two one. So now we're at three one. Three balls and one strike. Run on two hits in the top of the first inning for the Tornadoes. And Rudy Martin in a good spot here. The pitch up high. And there's back-to-back -back walks to start this bottom of the first inning to put runners aboard. And here comes Tanner Densford. Densford, who entered game one with a 7-4 and four record, left with a record of 7-5. and five. In its shortstop today with Lindsay on the hill and already an early meeting between that Purvis coaching staff and Chase Smith. For Coach Farlow, he carries a whole stable of assistants, Stephen Engel, Scott Howell, Andy McCarter, Joe Moody. We would expect that to be Stephen Engel. So many times you see the top guy uh, in that assistant coach rotation being the pitching coach. And so stepping in is going to be Tanner Densford, the shortstop. Densford went one for three with a single, a stolen base, a run scored. Grounded out to short in the first inning of game one. That could very well be a 6-4-3 double play if he were to do it again today. And again, Smith has yet to settle in. He's walked the first two batters. He's got guys with speed on the base pass to worry about, and he is just not having the type of start he would expect. Here's the butt put down, and it is tapped foul. So nothing in one here to Densford. Lewisburg came through the North with wins over Cleveland, Lafayette, as well as Houston in that 4A bracket. Here's a pitch. And the bunt pushed up the third base line, hooking foul. Wicked spin on that one. Heads up play that time by Holcomb behind the plate. If he goes and immediately picks it up, he's got a bang-bang play at first, trying to get it to Lambeth before Densford gets to the bag. Densford ready. So is Smith. Again, checking those runners. And again, he just... Just really at this point trying to read his body language and just get a feel for maybe where he's at mentally right now. And it just seems like he's very concerned about what is going on behind him, around him. 
rather than the just the most important task at hand, and that is working to the batter and Densford taking his first ball. Did not square around there. Pitch. Up high, two and two. And for obvious reasons, with an 0-2 hole, another foul bunt attempt, or even one that he can't connect to, where the bat, barrel of the bat goes through the zone, he is done. A foul bunt, strike, and you're out. And then that whiff with the barrel coming through the plate, you're out. And there's ball three. Chase Smith just having one of those starts that is not indicative of the performance that he has had all year for a Purvis baseball team that has had a ridiculously low team ERA, and Smith is at the top of those charts, third best on the team in terms of team ERA or total ERA, a 1.29 earned run average. Opponents bat only 173 against him. He's worked in 54 and a third of an inning, giving up 18 runs, 10 earned. 35 hits, his walk to strikeout numbers, 71 strikeouts against just 24 walks coming in. Here's the payoff pitch, and that is ball four. So Smith is in trouble, and obviously here in the first, there is no action in the Purvis bullpen. Right now, I'm glancing to see if anybody would head there, and they are not, but back to back to back, walks here in the bottom of the first inning for a team that is one of the best in the country pitching a baseball. 215 strikeouts to 60 walks coming into this series. First pitch on the way coming into Tanner Lloyd. There's a strike. Challenge him on the inside corner gets the strike call there for Lewisburg they walked four total times in game one here's a ground ball to second diving stop made flipped to second for a force and that is all they will get nice play by Aiken teaming up with Farrell for the force but Lloyd reaches on the fielder's choice gets credit for a run driven in Haney scores from third Martin goes from second to third and Densford is the only victim at second base on the 4-6 put out. Diving play by Aiken. And here comes Dalton tied to the plate. Coming set. Here's the pitch, the lefty deals. And that one is outside. So Dalton Todd looking at a one ball, no strike count. And a tie ball game, 1-1. So five innings earlier do the first runs come for the Patriots. Home run swing and a miss there by Todd. So many times it just takes not maybe something good to happen, but you just need something to happen and settle you into a ball game. It looks like Smith's a little bit better. There's a pitch, though, that they call foul. That got a piece of the bat, or did it catch a piece of the hitter? And they say it caught a piece of Dalton Todd. Well, how nonchalant can you be? Todd showed no indication of getting hit by a baseball. Three walks and a hit batter. And right now, we are seeing Purvis setting this game on a tee early on. Gabe Brown, the left fielder, gets ready to go here. Gabe Brown waits the Smith pitch and slats one to left field. First pitch he sees. That'll bring in one, and the Patriots will throw up the stop sign at third, play station to station baseball. But an RBI single by Gay Brown gives Lewisburg their first lead of the series. As Martin in from third, Lloyd goes to third, and the runner at second base, and that is Todd at second. 
So Hunter Wilson stands in the DH. Here's the pitch. There's a strike call. No balls in a strike, just one out. Bases full of Patriots, as you see the pitch. Good backhand play that time by Wilson. If you hit one in the gap here, it could clear the bases, and there's so much room to roam out there. 330 down the lines, 375 in the alleys, 401 is straight away center field as we zoom in on that meeting on the mound. And this is where Holcomb is going up to Smith. And yes, they're talking strategy, but as much as anything, Holcomb is saying, look, you've been here before. You've been one of our best all year. Go do what you do. And Smith is just having one of those out-of-body experiences right now with a little of the pressure. He's feeling it right now. Those, those nerves are running wild. Here's the pitch. Just like that, Smith gets ahead in the count, a ball and two strikes. Wilson looking for his first hit in this championship series after an 0 for 2 game one. Long fly ball, long foul ball. Count will remain at that one ball, two strike number. A Lewisburg team here for the first time. They advanced to the North title game series in 2010, but lost to New Albany in three games. Here's a ground ball, hit to short. They'll go to third for a force. That's really the only play they had with Farrell's momentum carrying him towards the bag at third. Got it to Roseberry, but a run scores. Wilson reaches on a fielder's choice. Lloyd in the score. Todd is the victim of that ground ball, six to five. But give Wilson the run batted in. And now runners at first and second base for Chris Taylor. And Lewisburg has grabbed a two-run lead here in this bottom of the first frame. Here's a ground ball to third. Roseberry's got it. Throw over to first in time, and that ends the inning. So three runs on two hits, no errors, and two left on base. And so we move, actually three runs on one hit, no errors, and two left. And we move to the top of the second inning. We'll take a break back in a moment. You're watching the MHSAA Network. We can get a player up here. Oh, that's good stuff. All right, perfect. Prepare a Wiley Ballard graphic. Do you want me to start the stream? Start the stream. Camera three. Beautiful. For more information on how your school can join the Play on School broadcast program and participate in the MHSAA network, go to playonsports.com slash SBP. 3-1 lead for Lewisburg through one inning here in game two of the Class 4A state championship baseball series. Josh West back here with you in our state capital, Jackson, Mississippi, Smithville Stadium. Nestled just off of I-55 here on Lakeland Drive, a, a venue that has seen so many special players, the likes of Daryl Strawberry. They've hosted from the Mayor's Cup to the Governor's Cup. They've hosted so many great college and high school baseball games, and their history gets a little richer after this week of baseball here in 2012. Back on the hill, the lefty, the sophomore for Lewisburg, Jonathan Lindsay, looking for his ninth win this afternoon. And both pitchers, Smith and Lindsay, with not their best stuff in that first inning, but Lindsay gets a chance to go out and go grab a mulligan. He gets a chance to go back out there and now with a couple of runs of cushions. And so here comes to the plate the Tornadoes. Tornadoes will send to the plate six, seven, and eight. Chris Aiken, Tyler Kitchens, and Lane Ratliff. Six, seven, and eight. Due up here in the top of the second inning. Aiken, the starting second baseman for the Tornadoes, looking for his first hit in this series. 
Only Aiken and Taylor out of the top eight did not re record a hit in game one. And the first pitch strike by Lindsey. And it's nothing in one to Aiken. Aiken. Doesn't mean he was not efficient, though, at the plate in game one. Here's the second pitch that paints the black. Now nothing in two, keeping it down and away from Aiken. Aiken got a run batted in, reached on a pair of errors at short, and so was very productive. And there's a called strike three, and Aiken in disbelief. Never got the bat off the shoulder there. Second strikeout victim for Lindsay, and what we're seeing is that Jackie Caldwell is going to record, uh, reward consistency behind the plate. Jackie, our home plate umpire. Lynn Shelley is over at first. James Walker is over at third, part of our three-man MHSAA crew. First pitch, this one in the gap. This one going to hit and take a one-hop at the wall. Nearly went over that first tier for a ground rule double. Instead, a big turn around second base for Tyler Kitchens. He'll go in with a one-out stand-up double. And Purvis right back to work here in the top of the second inning. And here comes Lane Ratliff. So Kitchens, that his third hit in the series. Now three for four and also has reached on a fielder's choice. So Kitchens had his first extra base hit. He had a pair of singles in game one. Now here's Lane Ratliff. He was 0 for three in game one. So here comes set. Pitch on the way from Lindsay, and that one down and away. Ball and no strikes to the DH. Ratliff, the designated hitter for Chase Smith. Lindsay, the tornado in scoring position, playing mind games. The pitch comes in. Kind of just a token attempt that time by Ratliff to show bunt and pull back and get one pitch further ahead in the count. 2-0 now coming. Nathan Roseberry is on deck. Two zero, big cut. Ratliff coming up and out of that one and. That was one of those where he might have been a little tight, a little nervous, and something just kind of twinged when he did that. He had to take a couple extra stretches after that particular swing. Lindsey deals. This one just foul. That one was snagged just wide by about a foot down the third baseline. Backhanded over there by Aaron Baker. Two balls and a strike now to Ratliff. The three runs in the bottom of the first inning for Lewisburg matched their entire game one output. As another big cut that time. And that retires Ratliff. It's the second time that we have, or I have rather, not been spot on on the balls and strikes. And it must have been a borderline pitch where I never saw the, the strike call. It must have been very delayed. But three strikeouts through the eight batter's face for Lindsay, And here comes Nathan Roseberry now. In the ninth spot, and they don't want to leave that runner do the Tornadoes in scoring position. First pitch, he was right on that one. Good cut that time by Roseberry. That one crawled right over the awning, as you see, hanging over the grandstand, providing that much-needed shade on a day where my dash coming into the stadium read 94 degrees. And I don't doubt it, and it's probably every bit of that, if not more, on the field turf playing surface here at Smithville Stadium. Kitchens had second after a one-out stand-up double to left. And the crowd wanted that for strike two. But instead, the count is even. Yeah. 
Lindsay starting to really work into a nice rhythm. Pitch on the way. And boy, did Dalton Todd know that was a strike. He popped very confidently up and out of his crouch stance behind the plate to toss that one back. Roseberry and the Tornadoes down to their final strike of the top of the second. Good snag that time. Two and two. Baseball, just such the ultimate chess match, gamesmanship. Different pieces being moved, maybe for just a couple of pitches, maybe for just one batter. 2-2. Two -two. This one hit in the gap to right field, but slicing over towards Taylor. When it left the bat, it looked pretty good, and then it ran out of steam. Taylor puts it away. Roseberry flies out to right, and the double goes for naught. So no runs on a hit, no errors, one left on base, and that in scoring position. And so we get set to move to the bottom of the second inning. Fans, we know you're enjoying this. And so don't forget that you can go back and watch it on demand anytime. You can go to MISSHSAA.TV and you can watch all the action along the MHSAA network on demand. It was fun this morning to go back and when I was researching this game to go back and look at some of the uh, couple of uh, clips and highlights from the football, from the basketball championships. And so these games, they'll mean a lot for a lot of people. And so now when you're trying to relay this story, you can say, well, you know you can go watch it, can't you? You can just go to MISSHSAA.TV and you can go back and watch it. And help us spread the word about this fantastic product that is powered by Play On Sports, part of the MHSAA network. This is just something that is really starting. This is a snowball that's been rolling for quite some time. And all of a sudden now, just here recently, it has been picking up a lot of nice wet snow would be the way to put it. It is, it is growing at a rapid pace. And we are seeing this play on network join up with states like Mississippi across the country to bring you the very best of these coverage, uh, this coverage of these championships. And they do, they do more than that. They team up with organizations and teams across the country. So as we move to the bottom of the second inning, Aaron Baker in the nine spot, then back to the top of the order in Lal Haney and Rudy Martin. So Baker stands in, starting third baseman, 321 hitter with 20 RBI, 11 doubles and a homer coming into the series. And he takes a first pitch strike from Chase Smith. A little nice way for Smith to start off the inning after walking three and hitting one in the first, Lewis Burr trying to build on a 2-1 lead as Baker slaps one long and foul and almost hit the pitcher's mound before bouncing out of play, as you saw. Vacant tornado dugout. That gives a lot of confidence to a guy like Smith who just so happens to be struggling early on. He only appeared as a pinch hitter in game one, did Smith. Here's a pop-up on the infield, right side. Lambeth calling off Aiken to put it away. So the pop up to first means one up, one down here in the bottom of the second inning and out of the top of the order in Lau Haney. Haney a walk, then got to second on a balk and then was able to come in to score on a Tanner Lloyd ground ball fielder's choice in the first inning to score Lewis Bird's first run of the game. Finds himself here in a hole. Smith filling up the zone much better here in the second. Puts one just outside as the count evens. Lloyd, 312 hitter coming into the series. Fouls one straight back. Lloyd coming in was 312. 34 hits, 24 RBI, nine doubles. Or excuse me, not saying Lloyd, but Lloyd is who drove in Haney. Haney stands in, rather. And Haney 
who just about got run up, rung up on strikes there. Haney. A 349 hitter. Tops on the team for a team that came in batting over 301. Hits this one over towards second. Knocked down, bobbled, and no play to be made. That was a play where Lambeth took a step for the baseball at first and kind of conceded to Aiken. Aiken, when Lambeth made that step, the second baseman for the Tornadoes just stopped for just a half second. And so instead of backhanding or cutting that ground ball off and then sliding and popping up, he had to dive for it and had no play. So it goes down as an infield hit for Lyle Haney. And for Haney, that's his third hit of the series. Here is Rudy Martin. So the one out single, Haney at first. Martin and Haney each walked and scored in the first. And so now we're going to see Smith, who has already had a couple of tosses over to first base with Lambeth holding the runner. How does he fare here in this inning with runners on? Again, toss to first. Lindsey and Smith, both left-handed, both going after each other here in game two. And there are so many teams that would love to just have the one left-hander. And for these programs, it's one of those reasons why you're here when you can give your opponents a different look. Tougher to pick up the baseball. Completely opposite to what a lot of hitters are used to. 1-0 pitch up high, two balls and no strikes. So we've seen how Smith can settle in and work with no runners on base. He did a better job here to start the bottom of the second inning, but now struggling to find the zone again, and it's now 3-0 to Rudy Martin. A run on three hits for Purvis. Three runs on two hits for Lewisburg. There's ball four. So the first runner gets aboard and then four straight balls. And now we have time called. We're going to have another meeting. And we're going to see a pitching change. So they're going to bring in Lambeth to pitch. This is going to be all for Chase Smith. Smith is going to last just an inning and a third here in this one. And they're going to pat him on the rear end and make a change. So Lambeth is going to come in from first base. Smith only goes an inning and a third, and his line is not closed because he has a couple of runners that are his responsibility. So now we'll get to glance in and look at Lambeth and get you his numbers. For Lambeth, this will be his ninth appearance, a record of four and two on the season. 20 strikeouts against four walks but has not worked the innings. He does have a .53 earned run average, however. An opponent's bat just 188 against him. He's worked in 26 and a third of an inning. He's faced 108 batters, given up five runs, two earned on 19 hits. And getting even, getting even a little bit deeper into his line. Trying to look at some of his numbers as in terms of what type of hits he has given up when he has been in there. He's given up a couple of doubles, a couple of triples, no home runs. Again, 20 strikeouts, four walks, only three hit batters. He had made five starts this season. Had a complete game shutout on his resume. And a .667 winning percentage, thus that four and two record. So here we go, new pitcher already. We were so spoiled in the game ones with the speed of the game, with the just efficiency of the defense and the pitchers. And one of the hardest things to do in all of sport is to hit a round ball with a round bat, and we saw that on Wednesday. But here we are, and I would even say, argue to say, and on Thursday as well, but here we are. We had that marathon of a game 
in seven innings, actually six and a half innings in that Greenville-St. Joe game. With Greenville-St. Joe nodding their se uh, series against Nanawoya, winning 11 to eight. Here's the pitch coming in from Lambeth and it slips right out of his hands and he throws it behind Tanner Densford. One ball, no strikes. So after a dozen batters faced by Chase Smith, after four walks and a hit batter, Purvis had seen enough. Here's a ground ball back up the middle. Fielding it, no, an error, and everybody's safe. Aiken was waiting on it to take a slow hop. Took the high hop over Lambeth. And so he was waiting on that baseball, and then you ever had that ice cream cone and the ice cream just fell off of it? That's what that baseball did. He had it, snow cone in the top of his mitt, and it just fell right off of it, right off the top. And so Smith is over at first with Lambeth on the mound. Here's one ripped up the middle, a base hit. Two runs will score, trying to go from first to third, the throw, and not in time, and that's going to allow Able to go over to second base, Lloyd. So a single, a walk, an error, a two RBI single by Tanner Lloyd. And it's now a five to one lead for Lewisburg. And now runners at second and third. And so we can close the book on Smith and it will not look that attractive. Here is Dalton Todd here. Six batter to come to the plate in the inning. In the five spot, gets a hold of one pretty good. Hits it way up into the air in left center field. Still going back, and that one just, I think, missed on the warning track. One run is in, the relay, and a slide. Two runs are in. And that's got to go down as a double with Lott giving chase in center field. It's now 7-1 Lewisburg. And it does indeed go down as a double. Lott in center who is giving chase. That ball was hit a ton. That ball was hit 370 feet. That is breaking a windshield in a high school ballpark. But here at Smith Wills, it stays in the park, but goes as a two RBI double. And so four runs are in here in the bottom of the second as Gay Brown fights off a first pitch fastball. So the way we're seeing Lewisburg perform here in game two makes you think that Nurse played a major role in their performance in game one. And there's a wild pitch. And going over to third is Dalton Todd. A run, three hits, one air for Purvis. Seven runs on just four hits. There have been four walks as well as a hit batter as well as the air surrendered by Purvis so far through less than two innings. Let's not forget, you look and see only one out. Here's one, back up the box, a base hit. An RBI single for Gabe Brown, it's eight to one. Five runs are in here in the bottom of the second inning. And here comes Hunter Wilson. A Lewisburg team coming in to this game. Trying to get a feel for under seven runs average per ball game. Probably in the neighborhood of six, six and a half runs average per ball game. Came into this series with 223 scored in 34 games. Ground ball to first. They have no play but to step on the bag. So Smith has to field, step on the bag. Brown advances to second. Wilson on the unassisted ground out to first base. Becomes the 
second victim of the inning. But here comes Chris Taylor. Taylor, who grounded out to third to end the first, represents the ninth batter to come to the plate for the Patriots here in the home half of the second. So eight unanswered runs after Purvis struck for a Phillip Lott triple to start the game in the top of the first, and then a sack fly with an RBI for Logan Farrell. Good pickoff move that time by Lambeth. Back in safely as Brown at second base. We had noted that we felt like Lindsey was settling in in the top of the second, how much more so with five more runs of support. One ball, one strike to Chris Taylor. Taylor looking for that elusive first hit. He's 0 for 3 in the series. Throw back, another swipe attempt. Good attempt that time. Farrell, very acrobatic swipe move. And there were a bunch of oohs and ahs in the crowd. Purvis trying to stop the bleeding. Pitch on the way. Now one and two. Lewisburg has put themselves in a position now where if they can fill up the zone and play solid defense, they can force a game three. Purvis is going to have to be special here over the next five innings at the plate. The pitch. Ground ball. This one is foul. Tracked down in foul territory by Chase Smith. Chase Smith got to be over there at first base and a little bit of shell shock. Lambeth as well has to be wondering what in the heck is going on. Lewisburg swinging the bat well. One, two. This one lined in the left, going to hang up for McElhenney, and that will end the inning. But five runs on four hits, one error, one left. Two complete here at Smithwell Stadium. And Lewisburg with a seven run lead in route to their quest to force game three in their first ever state title appearance. For Purvis, this is something that has been somewhat of a regular occurrence. And in the scheme of sports, it's almost been like that this is their invitational. This is the fifth time in the last 10 years they have been here. The first time, though, since a state championship appearance in 2007. But as we said at the top, they picked up back-to-back -back 3A titles in 2004 and 2005. And this is where the rally is to start for Purvis in a long quest back, Lewisburg has given Jonathan Lindsay right now just another shot of confidence. He's got to be feeling good, feeling very good about where he sits right now. These two teams each came in with 24 wins. It would be the first team of 26 that captured a championship, and Lewisburg would love to have as many wins at Purvis at the end of the day, 25. This Purvis team, let's not lose sight of the fact they haven't lost in these playoffs. As Philip Lott leading things off at the top of the order here in the top of the third inning. Philip Lott tripled and scored in the top of the first inning, and he felt like we might be about to see more of the same. But Coach Tony Farlow had to make a pitching change after an inning and a third, and Lewisburg jumped on Lambeth when he came out. A strike call makes it nothing in two to Philip Lott. And so there's a fine line now of not wanting to be too aggressive, being patient, but not being too patient. 0-2. Oh, Pretty good pitch that time again by Lindsay. Seems to be now dealing what he wants to, hitting his spots. 
Here's a rip at it by Lott, and he's going to line it over the airborne. Tanner Densford at short for a base hit. So Lott is aboard with his second hit and as many at bats. And here comes Hunter Holcomb. Holcomb, the catcher for the Tornadoes, is ready. Now working ahead in the count of ball and no strikes. one -0. Turns into two balls and no strikes. Holcomb struck out looking in the first. Holcomb got an infield single, scored a run in the fourth of game number one. 2 0 pitch. This one scooped into center, drifting over to put it away in right center is Rudy Martin. Got a great jump on that baseball, and that one just floated right into his mitt. And so Holcomb is retired. Well, these new BB Core bats, a lot of baseballs seem to get off the bat well, and they're it's you have the muscle memory well for us as baseball fans especially of college and high school baseball we've got the mental memory of the way the baseball used to jump off the old aluminum bats and so we see these and we think that might get down and it's not even close it just seems to go out there and flutter and run out of steam as now here at the plate is Logan Farrell Here's the pitch coming in, ground ball to short. Taylor made double play ball, six to four to three, double play ends the inning. Densford, Haney, and Lloyd roll the double play, and the Patriots get out of the inning. So Lindsey faces the minimum. No runs on a hit, no errors, none left. Two and a half in the books. And so Lewisburg, just like that, back up at the plate. Now that's exactly what Purvis did not need to have happen because they had the quick lead and I don't think there's any way this could be the case. But the way this game turned, Purvis comes out, gets the triple, gets the sack fly, then gets another single, and Purvis with a one game to none lead and a one run to none lead. Had to be feeling pretty good about themselves. And Chase Smith just unable to find his rhythm today. They have already turned to Lloyd Lambeth, the right-hander, who is in now. Lambeth is one of the seniors on this team. There aren't many seniors on this team. Just right at, right at seven. But you look at that compared and or rather contrasted to a Lewisburg team that starts five sophomores. It's a Lewisburg team that many people didn't think they'd be back here this year. They had to replace their top four hitters of a year ago. But now the way this team has developed, they've captured four state or four straight division championships out of DeSoto County, out of Olive Branch, Mississippi. And so this is a Patriot program that is not going to be going anywhere. So a seven-run lead. And at the plate to start it off again is Aaron Baker. Nine came to the plate. Five runs on four hits in the second. Baker swings, grounds one over to third. Roseberry comes up to Smith. Fires a strike, and there's one away here in the bottom of the third inning. This is game two of three on this championship Friday. Oak Grove and Madison Central play tonight. First pitch scheduled for 7 o'clock. Oak Grove got a very solid outing from their ace and a 4 nothing win. McCarty, where it's four innings, eight strikeouts. Pitches the shutout, just a sophomore. A lefty, that's 88-89.
and with tons of potential. Here's Lyle Haney. One for one, a single a walk and two runs scored. And Haney finds himself in an 0-2 hole here. Now a ball and two strikes. And the one, two, check swing and did not go. Lewisburg got to the North Half title game in 2010. They lost to New Albany in three games. Now to take the next step here if they don't win it here this year, well, then it's only a matter of time for this program with what, with all the tradition they're building, again, four straight district championships, with the access to so much competition, great coaches, great facilities, DeSoto County becoming another Mississippi baseball hotbed. 3-2, that is a fair ball just over the bag at third. And not getting down the line very quickly that time was Haney. Good job by McElhenney and Farrell to get the baseball back into the infield. What could have been extra bases and a double ends up being the second single of the day for Haney, but Haney just continues his blazing start to this series. Now four for five with four singles, three runs scored a pair of stolen bases, and a pair of walks. He has been dynamite. And so Coach Farlow is out to discuss that particular play. So James Walker having to explain himself right now. And these are never fun. But James told him exactly what he needed to hear. And there was complete resolve by Mr. Walker that time. And no hesitation in the call. He just backed up, got a good look at it. Half the battle, if not more, is just being in the right position to make the call. And James Walker got in a great position to make that call. First pitch coming in. Fastball. This is high. Martin, two walks and two plate appearances and two runs scored. All eight of the runs have been scored by the top five guys in the lineup. Martin, opposite way. This one's trouble. Diving play. Oh, my goodness. Sign that one up for Sports Center. Beautiful. Robs a hit from Rudy Martin. Good grief, that was good. That's the one that's going to have everybody talking, I think, from both fan bases when this game is done, regardless of the outcome. It, you know, one team is going to say, oh, we won, it was fantastic, and, and there was this play. Even the team that loses this game is going to say, oh, it was, it was heartbreaking, but there was this play. we got to watch Sports Center tonight. It could be there. That was special. And now... A good pickoff play, and the Tornadoes get the runner at second. Haney gets himself in a pickle and is gunned down at second, and that ends the inning. Three innings in the book here, and it feels like we're just getting started. It's an eight to one lead for Lewisburg. Lewisburg. We'll take a break, we'll be back in a moment. You're watching the MHSAA Network. Do you want me to start the stream? Start the stream. Camera three. Beautiful. For more information on how your school can join the Play on School broadcast program and participate in the MHSAA network, go to playonsports.com slash SBP. An 8-1 lead for Lewisburg here at Smithwell Stadium, and we were talking 
in the break. That is one that well, we're nominating it for the top ten. Uh, that's one that I hope that people across the country get to enjoy. That might make a lot of different college and pro broadcasts in terms of just discussion on that play. Talk about making a name for yourself. Logan Farrell did just that. And it's unfortunate that he grounded into the double play or he just about was leading off the inning. And to start this inning, here is Lambeth slapping one the opposite way for a single to right. So it doesn't take long for Purvis to get going here in the top of the fourth inning. So it was looking like that Haney was going to be at second. Martin was going to be at first. And it was looking like that with one out. Instead, Martin robbed by Farrell. And then the 2-6 put out retires Haney trying to get to second base to end the last inning. And here's a ground ball hit to second, backhand in the hole, flip, no, oh goodness. That's gonna go down as an error and it's gonna be a throwing error. It's gonna be the E4 on Haney. And Haney's just had a couple of bad plays. He had the pickoff and now he's kinda hanging his head a little bit. He's gotta find a way to regroup. So runners at first and second. McElhaney reaches on the fielder's choice. Lambeth reaches on the air. And so Purvis, sensing they've got a chance right here to make their run, it's going to be up to Lindsay to quiet the crowd. Jonathan Lindsay from the stretch. Patriots were starting to pinch in at the corners with Chris Aiken at the plate. Aiken, the second baseman, grounded, or rather struck out looking in the second. Grounded out to short and reached on a pair of errors in game one. Did have a run batted in. They shield him a touch towards right. Ground ball here, charging it short. They'll get the force at third, and that's the only play that Densford had going to Baker at third. Aiken reaches on the fielder's choice. So all in all, Patriots get the lead runner. McElhenney at second, Aiken at first. Both of those young men have reached on fielder's choices. And Tyler Kitchens, who doubled with an out in the second, but would never moved, was stranded at second base, comes up now with one away and two on. Tornadoes, it's a process. They've got to start chipping away. This would be a huge, huge Inning to work out up for Lindsay and the Patriots. As Kitchen gets ahead in the count. Purvis struck first for a run in the top of the first. Three in the bottom of the first for Lewisburg. Five more in the bottom of the second as they chase starter Chase Smith from the ball game. 1-0 pitch, races inside, but misses again. Two balls and no strikes. Chase Smith will be batting. So Lane Ratliff, the DH, will not be hitting next. The ball down low in the turf, and apparently... Dalton Todd shake it up just a little bit. So Todd shaking up. That hit him in an uncomfortable spot. Rattled him just a moment. And a nice gesture by Jackie Caldwell, our home plate umpire, to go and brush off the plate, give Todd as much time as he needed. Wasn't as severe as some we've seen. Kitchens to take all the way and takes ball four. Bases are loaded. And this is probably the opportunity of the day. You don't know how many times an opportunity like this will present itself. 
and how poetic that Chase Smith, who went just an inning and a third, gave up five runs on two hits, all earned. No strikeouts, walked four and hit a batter. Has a chance here to step up. Batting in the eighth spot of the lineup. Replacing the designated hitter, Lane Ratliff, who had been 0 for 3 in this series and who had already struck out swinging in this game. He stands in with a chance to help himself here. He can get himself off the hook if he can help the comeback right now. After only an inning and a third, he's struggling. After the foul chop, oh, one pitch. Big swing and a miss that time by Smith. He was looking to plant one over the scoreboard out there in left field. Nothing in two, just one out. Now the count to a ball and two strikes. Chase Smith, his other at bat in this series, was in a pinch hit roll. And he's 0 for 1. Here's a ground ball hit to short. That one bobbled. Underhand flip to second. And a nice recovery that time by Densford to get the four. So run scores. Was a perfectly hit hot shot to turn a 6-4-3 double play. Would have been the second turned by Densford and Haney in the ball game. But it wasn't meant to be. McElhenney scores from third, making it an 8-2 ball game. Aiken advances to third. Kitchens is the lone victim. Retired 6-4 on the force. Smith reaches on the fielder's choice and gets a run batted in. And here comes Nathan Roseberry. Runners at the corners now with two away in the inning. And here's the pitch. This one hits straight back. And I misspoke with the one out in the inning. So here's one lifted into right center field. This one going to get down. This will bloop in for a hit. And this will be an RBI single. So the RBI single makes this an 8-3 to three ball game. Five-run ball game. Runners at first and second base now for the top of the order in Phillip Lott. Here's the pitch coming in. And there's strike one. Lot two for two, a triple and a single. Here's a ground ball chopped to first. They will go step on the bag to get one. And the runners advance, and that is the second out of the inning. Should be the third out of the inning. That's, the scoreboard shows had shown one. Our monitor had shown one. I thought I thought it was three as well. There was a force out at third. And there it is. And then the force at second. And there the play at first. We, everybody in the whole stadium was just a hair off on that particular play. So it happens to all of us. But we move halfway through and move to the bottom of the fourth inning of an eight to three ball game. That ground out to first ends it. And if people are going, whoa, whoa, wait, wait a minute. Well, there was the force out at third, the force out at second, and then the ground out at first. So that did, in fact, uh, in the rather wrap up that inning. But, boy, you start to get a little nervous when you glance up at the monitor and see one, when you have two on your score sheet. Then you glance up at the scoreboard and see one, and you're thinking, well, are you the only one? Then you get the call in your ear going, wait a minute. Everybody on their book has two, but everybody on their particular 
scoring apparatus, whether it's a piece of paper, a scoreboard, or a monitor, only has one. So we've, we've got three outs, and that is indeed the right call here. So as we move to the bottom of the fourth inning, Purvis accomplished somewhat of what they were looking for there, getting two runs on two hits. There was an error, and there were a couple left on base, but they were wanting to start to chip away at this lead, and the Tornadoes did just that. Getting two of the six back, it's now an 8-3 to three ball game, and so now Lewisburg could really hurt some feelings here with their three, four, and five hole hitters due up. It is Tanner Densford due up here. Three, four, and five, Densford, Lloyd, and Ty. And a first pitch strike into Densford. Densford is 0 for 1, but has reached on an air and a walk and scored a run. So 0 for 1 only tells a small fraction of that story. 0-1 pitch, swing and a miss. Nothing in two. A crowd of 1,700 was here for the 6A game one on Wednesday night. We can only imagine we're going to top that number here tonight in our 7 o'clock game. Right now we've got Jackson, Mississippi rush hour traffic, which by no means compares to, say, a Memphis, Atlanta, Birmingham, Baton Rouge, New Orleans, but still... It's going to prevent people from getting very quickly to the ballpark coming in. Especially from the south, people from the Madison area just right up the road in Madison County, only about a 15-minute drive down the interstate. They'll let traffic clear out and start making their way here probably about 6 o'clock. Pitch coming in here. This one hit on the nose to center field. Drifting back is lot, and that it played perfectly straight away and deep. And so Densford is retired on the fly ball to center field. Tanner Lloyd. Good day already. A single, reached on a fielder's choice. Scored two and driven in three. Lloyd's ready to roll. Pitch comes in and misses inside for ball one. On the bump, not the starter but in relief and extended relief, Lloyd Lambeth and what feels like he is making his sixth start of the season after the starter Chase Smith went only an inning and a third. That pitch grays Lloyd and so Lloyd gonna get a free pass down to first base. If you're looking at just free passes issued, there have been six now. That's the second time a Patriot batter's been hit by a pitch and there have also been four walks in this game. So here comes Dalton Todd in the five spot in the lineup. And those walks and hit batters tell the story of why the scoreboard looks the way it does. Eight runs on six hits for Lewisburg and an error. Three runs on six hits and an error for Purvis. Fastball comes in. Paints the black low and away from Todd. Todd, a two RBI double, a run scored, a part of that five run second. Was hit by a pitch and forced out at third in the first. Here's the 1 1. So, with a count now at 2 and 1 to Dalton Todd, he's probably sitting on one particular mistake from Lambeth. Looking for his pitch right here. 2-1. This one goes back up the middle. Snagged, bobbled, and no play to be made. Or did he? Stuck his foot back and made the play. So the young man, Farrell, Logan Farrell, who will probably make national sports news with that diving play last inning, comes up with an unbelievable heads-up play just to stick his foot out. He had the force at second. He was bobbling it. My instinct would have been to reach over and tag. That's why I said it's not going to have a play. He just reached back and stuck out his foot. He had the force. Heady play that time by Farrell. And so now after Coach 
Cagle comes out to talk. There's more discussion. The whole crew going to get together. Jackie Caldwell, Lynn Shelley, and James Walker to discuss and uphold the ruling on the field, the call on the field. So Todd hits into the fielder's choice. Lloyd is forced out at second base. There are two outs here in this bottom of the fourth inning. And Gabe Brown, who is two for two with a pair of singles and two runs driven in, stands in. Swinging away and fouling one off. Sun is setting off to our left, off to the west. We are facing northeast here at Smithwell Stadium. So it gets pretty tough over there in right field and at second base if one is popped up or looped out over there towards second. There's a 1-0 lead for Purvis, then eight unanswered for Lewisburg. Purvis got a couple of runs back here in the top of the fourth. Pitch comes in. Framed pretty well that time by Holcomb. But that's going to be ball two. Could be a busy day for South Mississippi. We hope to have Rod Walker join us with the Clarion Ledger to talk about just this entire tournament and talk about some of the stories and the prospects and the programs that are competing in this year's championships. We hope to have him joining us in just a few moments. I think everybody's gotten really into this game, and so hopefully he'll remember here in just a minute. There's a strike when it was needed most on 3-1. A little bit of a breeze now as we're going to cool off this evening. It'll be very pleasant out here at the ballpark tonight. As a throw down to first, and Todd is back standing up. Todd, one of the few catchers that I see that doesn't have a courtesy runner. You can have a courtesy runner in high school baseball. He doesn't utilize that. He likes to run. And that time, a foul ball by Gay Brown took out the sponsor's sign. Guess that would be a perfect opportunity to mention our sponsor, Mississippi Sports Medicine. Their banner just got taken out. They're the title sponsor of this championship baseball tournament, and they provide two athletic trainers for every game of these championships. Here's a ground ball. Pulled foul, wide of the bag at third. Looking out into left field. I think I want to say that that Madison Central might be out there already. They are. Madison Central is here, but the Patriots do have someone warming in their bullpen. Payoff pitch. This one looped into center field. Lot playing deep, not going to get there. Big turn around second. Throw coming in, and that one backed up by Lambeth nicely, or that scores a run. A blaze of glory was Dalton Todd and winded as he gets to third base, hands on his hips. Nice job that time by Lambert to save a run. Goes down as a single. Brown gets to second on the throw. But that answers my question as to why Todd likes to run and doesn't have a courtesy runner. Because he can flat out scoot. So Hunter Wilson, who was grounded out to first in the second, reached on a fielder's choice and driven in a run in the first. He looks for his first hit here. Here's the pitch. This one popped up on the infield, racing in, diving play made by Aiken. And that will end the inning in Lewisburg, frozen for the moment at eight runs. So the bloop over there to second, and that wraps up the fourth inning. And fans, don't forget, not only are these games on demand, but you can also purchase DVD copies of today's game by logging onto the web at MISSHSAA.TV. When you click there and browse all the championship games that have been a part 
of this year's championship broadcast put on by Play On Sports as part of the MHSAA network. You can go back and see a full year of archives there. Watch those on demand and then purchase those DVDs so that you can cherish a copy for a lifetime. So as we move to the top of the fifth inning, an eight to three ball game, Rod Walker is sitting down as we speak here to join us here in this fifth inning. Rod Walker, a writer for the Clarion Ledger, the state's largest newspaper. He has got the fun task of going out and telling the stories, following the programs, painting the picture in words of all the great high school sports that we enjoy. It is really a state that is second to none, Rod, in terms of what high school sports mean to the lifeblood of communities. And, Rod, you get to really just see so many neat things throughout the course of the year. Yeah, and that's the best part about this job, man. You know, I just all these small towns in Mississippi, and then you got this larger communities right here in the Jackson metro area, and just so many different stories out there. Um, unfortunately, can't even get to all of them because there's just so many of them out there, but uh, that's definitely the part of the job that I enjoy the most. Rod, you get to put together from the Dandy Dozens to the postseason awards to preseason previews to covering these championship games. You really get to start the story and put the bookend on it as well. You get to go with these programs and teams start to finish, and, and that's got to be uh, a nice sense of accomplishment at the end of another long season. Oh, without a doubt. You know, we, we're at the end of a school year here in the next couple of days, and, um, you know, by the time it ends, a couple of weeks from now, I'll be turning around getting ready for that football dandy dozen. So it's like a nonstop, it's a year-round thing, and, uh, you know, it's just something I look forward to every year. This is one of those events. There's so many events on the national stage of sports that don't disappoint when you think of uh, so many different events from the Super Bowl as of late to some of the dramatic events like the Masters or the U.S. Open or Wimbledon or some of the, the storied events. But on the high school level, right here in Mississippi, we come in knowing there's going to be drama at the highest degree because these uh, athletes do it for purely the love of the game, and this might be the last time they ever take a field for these seniors and it never disappoints. It never does, and, th and that's the thing about it. I mean, these kids, they're just out there playing because they enjoy playing the game, and like you said, I mean, a lot of these guys, most of these guys will never play again. This is their last time putting on a uniform for a school, so that's why they go out and play so hard, and that's what makes this game so special. Hunter Holcomb went chasing there and goes down swinging on strikes, his second strike out of the day. Holcomb, Farrell, Lambeth was how it's going to shake out here on the top of the fifth inning. Two, three, and four for Purvis, who find themselves down by a handful of runs. Logan Farrell, who made that outstanding Sports center esque diving play in shallow left center to rob a hit away from Rudy Martin, now stands up with a sack fly, a run batted in, but is also grounded into a double play. Yeah, and we're play, here. Uh, Go that ahead. That play was one of the best plays I've seen in the, um, in the three days we've been here so far. Uh, uh, just a really big time play by the shortstop on that diving catch. But how about throughout the years of this tournament? Uh, you, th you, th that was as good as it gets. Oh, it really was. I, I'm hoping a t TV camera or something got that and can maybe send it in to somebody because it definitely needs to be uh, seen by more than the people that are here today. Oh, that's, well. that's exactly right. We were talking about that with the truck. Uh, that is something that will be submitted. So it'll be something to keep your eyes Q2 as now all of a sudden three balls and no strikes to Logan Farrell. We are joined by Rod Walker, writer for the Clarion Ledger, and Rod covers all the high school sports here in this state. There have been so many neat storylines that are developing. The Greenville-St. Joe storyline continues. Uh, that's a neat one with the that one family with the brothers there, the Rester brothers. That's neat, and there's so many neat things. What are a couple of other neat things that – our fans will see in, in words in the coming days and some little underlying themes in this tournament right now. Uh, you know, something I, I, I talked to a guy yesterday at Southeast Lauderdale. He's, um, his name is Blake McMullen, and he's, um, he was one of our top seniors to watch list coming to the season, one of the better players in the state. You know, this is one of those guys, this is going to be his last time playing baseball. He's a guy that's good enough to play um, on the college level at some level without a doubt, but, you know, he's been called to the ministry, and he wants to do that, and that's what he's going to do. And, you know, tomorrow could, be, could very well be his last high school baseball game, but, you know, he's been called, and that's what he wants to do. And, you know, it just says a lot about him to uh, accept that call. Uh, it's so neat when you say that because it, it's going to be neat. Let's 
I probably would have to say he's not going to be a betting man because he's in the ministry, but we would have to say he's probably going to start up a church softball team at his church. What do you think? Oh, uh, without a doubt. When he's a head it. pastor. I think that that's going to happen. I think they'll have a pretty good baseball team. Well, Lloyd Lambeth is here right now with two outs, and uh, we, we were set up for a potential day five scenario on Monday for the game threes. Uh, we're one for one, and we look like we might be two for two in that department. Uh, what would happen? Have you talked to Todd anything about that? You know, when you when you set something like that, if necessary, maybe room for three or four games, usually it's going to kind of make you look silly. It's going to somehow throw a curveball, to use a baseball term. What has Todd said if we have a lot of Game 3 series? We have a lot of Game 3s. I mean, they have Monday and Tuesday available, and they'd go to Tuesday if they have to. They're not going to play more than um, more than three games on Monday. So if we get to four game threes, I mean, somebody will be playing on Tuesday. Well, there's your answer as a fly ball to center field ends the inning. A one, two, three frame for the Tornadoes as they are stuck in neutral for the moment at three runs. And so we'll move to the bottom of the fifth inning in just a moment. But we'll stay here right now here on the MHSAA Network as we're talking with Rod Walker for the duration of this inning here at Smithville Stadium in Jackson. And a lot of talk coming in was uh, some people were disappointed that they weren't going to be at Trustmark. Not disappointed to come to Smith Wells, but disappointed to not be in that $27 million baby. But this is a, a historic place, and when you've had the weather that we've had and the crowds that we've had and the quality of baseball that we've had, uh, field conditions have been perfect for this. I think everybody has really been pleasantly surprised at just how much life that this venue still has left in it. Yeah, I think so, too. And I think at the end of the day, these kids, they don't really care where they play. You could put them on a, in a pasture in the middle of a field and they play for a state championship. So, you know, I don't think that really matters to these kids at all. Uh, some of the fans, you know, may have, may be accustomed to um, trust Mark. But I think this has been a great, you know, been a great tournament so far. It has been fantastic. And Con Maloney, uh, so gracious to work with the MHSAA and, and Don and Con, they have they've worked together to, to put this and you know they've added some of the things the MHSAA logo right behind home plate which is so gorgeous and just some aesthetic things that have just been able to to take this ballpark back to some of its glory days this is another one of those glory moments for this ballpark what's been one of your fondest memories of this ballpark throughout your years of covering some of the local colleges and some of the uh, series and games that have been played here uh, you know I, I had a chance to watch um couple of I guess it was called the Mayor's Tr Cup trophy back then they play at Smith Wheels back in the day State and Ole Miss and I just remember how bad the traffic was on Lakeland Drive you had to park down here by the fire stations I mean it was just really um, just a lot of uh, a lot of people here just in this state and they fill it up um, think about that I, I come to Jackson Senators here um, I was a semi-pro team uh, independent league professional team next to what it was and uh, that was the first year they brought the turf in here and the turf was really um, lively back then. Balls would really, really take some weird hops sometimes, especially when it goes to the outfield. And um, it, was, it looks like over the years that the turf isn't as um, – it doesn't make the ball jump as high as it did back when it first was um, installed years ago. Yeah, it's neat. The bounces were bigger then, and, and the track was slower. Now the track is sped up. The infield plays a lot more like a normal infield, almost identical. And as you touched on, the bounces aren't like they were. To set people up where we are, Chris Taylor reaching on that air, getting to advance to second because the ball was thrown out of the field of play. So it ends up being a two-base air that goes against Lloyd Lambeth. Taylor's aboard in scoring position at second with nobody out. Aaron Baker here in the ninth spot before we go back to the top of the order with the two guys that have been killer for Lewisburg in this game and in this series, Lal Haney and Rudy Martin. For the Tornado pitchers, they've had struggles with guys on base. They've had given a lot of attention to those base runners. Showing bunt, pulling back is Baker. Now two balls and no strikes. Baker's 0 for 2. A pop up to first and then a ground out to third. But an 8 to 3 ball game and the walks, the hit batters, for Purvis early rod is what allowed Lewis Bird to jump out quickly, giving Jonathan Lindsay, who's just a sophomore, we forget that sometimes, just a sophomore, that run support, he settled in nicely, and Lewis Bird seems to be in a very nice spot right now. Yeah, I know I talked to a coach the other day, and he talked about how young this Lewis Bird team was, um, just a bunch of sophomores up and down that lineup, and just for them to even be here in Jackson, it says a lot about what the job he's done up there. As we saw, Chase Smith, 
do everything he could to hold on to that baseball, or rather, that was actually Chris Aiken, the second baseman, coming over to cover with Smith charging on that bunt from first. But credit a good throw that time by Hunter Holcomb. And so now runner at third with one out. So that sacrifice bunt accomplished its mission, and that puts the ninth run 90 feet away to extend the lead back to six. Lewis Burke is led by as many as seven. They grabbed an eight, one lead after a five run second inning. Three runs on six hits, two errors for Purvis, eight runs, eight hits, and an error for Lewisburg. Touching on the youth for Lewisburg and Coach Cagle, I've got a thought on that as well that I that I approached him with it. I talked to him before game one, and after this pitch, I'll give it to you as that misses for a ball. And the count is now two balls, no strikes. Yeah, he said, I said, Coach, uh, regardless of what happens this year, you're not going anywhere, are you? And he said, no, we're not going anywhere. This program's not going anywhere. They plan to make this an annual event. Yeah, and this is a school. Your school's fairly um, new. They've been open for six or seven years, I guess. And uh, baseball is really hot up in DeSoto County. They got two teams down here in Jackson with uh, Lewisburg and Hernando, which is playing for the uh, 5A state title. So it says a lot about this school to uh, be such a new school to have a team playing for a state title already. Um, you know, this soon uh, kind of reminds you of the Risen Titans last year. You know, they're 5A. I uh, won state championship last year, and that school's been open, you know, 10, I guess 10 years, I guess now. And, you know, it just, just says a lot about those communities to be able to build a baseball program so soon and win a state championship. There are a lot of schools in the state that are still looking for their first, first baseball title. So. Four balls and five pitches. Lyle Haney at the top of the order draws the walk to put runners at the corners. And here comes Rudy Martin. Martin 0 for 1 with two walks. Two runs scored, could have easily been one for one, but it was that play we've been talking over and over about by Logan Farrell, the shortstop, on a blue ball that was trouble and shallow left field. He was the only player that had any play, and it was completely going airborne horizontal. Farrell laying out to Rob Martin of a hit. And so now with runners at the corners and one out, Martin back at the plate to work against Lloyd Lambeth. Lambeth has been in after the first three batters of the first inning. Chase Smith, the starter, went only an inning and a third. Gave up five runs, all earned on just two hits, four walks, and hit a batter. And time is called. We're going to talk to Stan Caldwell, Rod, in our next game about the South Mississippi Hattiesburg area baseball juggernaut. Central Mississippi, the same can be said for here, but as you touched on, DeSoto County, the level of five and six A schools that are there right now with the uh, suburbia of Memphis moving into Mississippi, how many five and six A schools reside there now? Uh, well, you have, you have the two schools that are, well, Lewisburg's 4A, but you also have Fernando, you got South Haven, Horn Lake, Olive Branch, and all those schools. You know, Center Hill. Center Hill, yeah, all those schools. And they're all doing really, really well in, in all sports. And it's, just, it's phenomenal how, how that area has grown and how they've all just all the schools have been able to you know maintain a high level of athletics it's all about rooftops and a tax base and they've got all that and the shopping and dining has come and uh, the DeSoto Center has come there uh, I wouldn't be surprised for just more and more to grow there you get your, your 20 30 minutes out of downtown Memphis and you've got six eight lanes of traffic and you couldn't get to one of those exits at rush hour or get off the interstate if you wanted to Here's a pitch that's in the turf and did not get far enough away for the runner to advance home. But taking off to second is Lowell Haney on that pitch in the dirt. So runners at second and third. You know, you look at a school like Lewisburg and you look at their crowd, they're, you know, they're outnumbered pretty big here today. But, uh, you know, the school is so new that they haven't really had a chance to, um, to build up a fan base because, you know, the people who've graduated are probably just in college or just graduating from college so you know, they're still building that fan base and over time they'll, like, they'll end up growing and it will really pick up. After a one out walk the bases are now loaded and we're going to see another pitching change. Coach Farlow going to make a change. We'll see a new arm check into the ball game here. Rod's going to stay with us and talk to us through this pitching change before he 
gets back to his duties. Rod, your duties pick up a lot tonight with the lone local team here in the Jackson Metro, uh, Madison Central. And you look out and see Chase Smith going to go out to right field. That means we'll move Lambeth back over to first. And I'm just looking to get a glance at the jersey here of our pitcher that is going to be into the ball game. That is going to be Tyler Kitchens, the right fielder. So let's give you Kitchens' numbers here on the season. For Kitchens on the year, he brings in a .47 earned run average. And teams bat 179 against him. He's worked in only 15 innings, faced 60 batters. He's given up two runs, one earned on 10 hits. And for Kitchens, 17 strikeouts against just three walks. This will be his 11th appearance of this season. He has one save and a record of 1-0 on the year. So Kitchens, the side armor, will give Lewisburg something more to look at here in a five-run ball game, in a game that is approaching almost an hour and 40 minutes here this afternoon. And Rod, you're talking about the fan bases for these schools. How about a little community like Nanawoya leading the cheers, incredibly enthusiastic. Uh, the whole town comes out. Some of the larger communities, more transplants. Uh, some might not have any connection to a particular school. Uh, one way or the other and so it's very interesting to see how these small teams their fan bases can be the ones that uh, everybody really wants to model their program after yeah without a doubt you know um Nanawaii today they were really here in full force and uh one of the biggest crowds we've had other than you know that madison central oak grove i guess the other the other night uh, uh yeah like you said the whole town of Nanawaii had to be here i don't think there were many people left in um you know up, up there this this afternoon an 8-3 to three ball game, this is the pinch. And you look and see five walks, two singles, and Farrell had to make an all-world play to get Martin out the one time those top two guys have been retired in this Lewisburg order. They're getting it done as the pitching change moves Smith from first to right. It moves Lambeth back to first with the in infield pinched in. Aikens from right field in on the mound from the stretch. This one back up the middle of base hit. That's automatic with the infield pinched in. And two runs will score. The throw will be cut off. And it is now a 10-3 ball game just like that. Tanner Densford comes through in a big way for the two RBI, his first two RBI of the series. Yeah. And before the season, when we talked about this team, it was, you know, people talked about um, Dalton Todd and they talked about Tanner Dance, but those are the two, you know, the two guys that are supposed to carry the load, and both of them have actually stepped up and played really well this whole um, series so far. They absolutely have. Densford has done such a good job, you know, wanting to bounce back, feeling like he had something to prove after the way the first game went down. Lewisburg has had one bad inning. And almost the same could be said for Purvis. Purvis has had one bad inning. And that being the second today, Lewis Birds with the, was the bottom of the first of game one. It's a 10-3 ball game now. Here's a ground ball. Hit over to short. They'll go to third for the force. And that's the third time in this game we have seen a 6-5 to five force out with a hitter reaching on the fielder's choice. That's just not something that I had called all year covering a pair of local high school teams. We've seen three 6-5 to five put outs in this game. Yeah, it doesn't happen a whole, whole lot. And <laughs> great plays by the shortstop there. To it is. Good awareness. Definitely is. So runners at first and second now with two outs in a seven-run ball game. We are joined by Rod Walker of the Clarion Ledger here in the press box. Our coverage here along the MHSA network powered by Play On Sports. You can go to MISSHSAA.TV, watch on-demand videos, and purchase DVDs. As the count is even at a ball and a strike. Densford is at second. Lloyd is at first. Aikens. Set. Deals, and that one is low and away.
Dalton Todd is at the plate, the catcher. The 2 1 popped up. This should get Purvis out of the inning. A lot ranging over. Puts it away. And that will end the inning. But two runs, two hits, one error. And there was one left on base, or check that, two left on base. And so we move to the sixth inning. Rod, thanks for joining us. As always, a pleasure. Uh, thanks for having me. He's Rod Walker, the Clarion Ledger. It's a 10-3 ball game. Lewisburg on top of Purvis here in game two of this for a best of three. We'll take a break. Back in a moment, you're watching the MHSAA Network. Wiley Ballard graphic. Do you want me to start the stream? Start the stream. Camera three. Beautiful. For more information on how your school can join the Play on School broadcast program and participate in the MHSAA network, go to playonsports.com slash SBP. John Ross McElhenney, Chris Aiken, Tyler Kitchens. Five, six, and seven, two up for the Tornadoes with a one game to none lead in this best of three series, but trailing by seven. It has been the Patriots since the bottom of the first inning. Tornadoes struck for one at the top of the first, a triple by Phillip Lott, and then a sack fly by Logan Farrell, two batters later, but then eight, run, eight runs unanswered by the Patriots. That lead was trimmed to five in the top of the fourth, but now back to seven. And here is McElhenney. McElhenney, 0 for 2, has hit into a pair of fielders' choices, has come in to score a run in this game, and he starts it off here. Pitch coming in from Lindsay, first pitch Soft chop back to Lindsay, and he'll turn and throw to Lloyd for the out. So one pitch and one out, and that was not the start that Purvis was looking for. Down seven with five outs to work with here in the top of the sixth inning. Lindsay deals, ground ball hit to short. Densford's got it on to Lloyd, two pitches. Two outs, and if you go back to the fourth inning, six in a row retired right now by Lindsey. So he has been impressive. Tyler Kitchens now on in relief of Smith in the bottom of the fifth, and Smith was in relief, or excuse me, on in relief of Lambeth, who was in a relief of Smith. As Lindsey deals ball one to Kitchens. Kitchens. The double and the walk, one for one in the game. Home run cut. That proves empty there and evens the count. Purvis has to be patient. They need base runners. Down to their final out here in the sixth as Kitchens fights one off. A ball and two strikes. You heard from Rod Walker that we will play no more than three games on Monday. So we are on our way, it seems, to having at least two on Monday. And these games very well might spill into Tuesday. Now a 2-2 count to Tyler Kitchens. A 10-3 ball game. In favor of Lewisburg, Lindsay gets another ground ball. This one over to Haney, to Lloyd, and the inning is over. And for the second inning in a row, Purvis has gone down in order. No runs, no hits, no errors, no one left on base. To the bottom of the sixth we go. Lewisburg will have Brown, Wilson, Taylor coming up as we transition there right now, six, seven, and eight. So Lewisburg has put themselves in a great position. They've got a seven run lead, they need three outs. They can finish it with three runs right here in the bottom of the sixth inning, but they look to be well on their way to evening this series, and a game three would be to be determined on Monday. 
So these games have been good, and they're getting better and better as we go along. As I want to glance down to that Patriot bullpen, see if I can get a beat onto who would be warming. Madison Central is already here. Oak Grove is here as well. So both of our teams for our 7 o'clock contest are here. And so coming set is Aiken. Aiken is getting loose again. Looks like we've got some soft tossing going on down in that far bullpen, that Lewisburg bullpen. There's a stray Madison Central player. There's three or four stray Oak Grove players. And then there's a couple of guys just soft tossing down in that Lewisburg bullpen. And I think I just saw the motion. That's going to give us the answer we were looking for. Let's see if I can pull the note here. It's going to be the senior Tyler Scholl, the 6'3 submariner who's their closer, who will more than likely see in the top of the seventh inning. Interesting story. He goes 86 with a fastball over the top. When he was a freshman, he was about 5'7 and was pretty weak. And a guy that was just barely hanging on for his playing career there. Well, then as a sophomore, stays around. He gains a few pounds. Fastball goes up to low 70s, and he's five feet 10. Well, then Tyler becomes a junior. He's now 6'1". He's throwing 74, 75 miles per hour. He's putting on a little more weight. Now he's a senior. He's 6'3", 185 pounds, and you don't know whether he'll throw it from over the top or submarine the pitch until he separates the ball from his mitt. So what a nightmare for hitters, and on this day, Purvis hitters who have struggled. And now we see leading things off with a hit, the Patriots. So Gabe Brown leads things off and puts the finishing touches on what probably is going to be a four for four day. Gabe Brown, four bats, now four singles, and he also has two runs batted in. And here comes Hunter Wilson. So again, Lewisburg has a couple of scenarios playing out right now. They can bring in their closer if it goes to the seventh. They could get three runs and close it down here in the sixth. And it is Chris Aiken on the hill checking the runner. Quick throw to first. Back in safely was Gabe Brown. Lambeth is back over at first base. Here's the pitch. Here's the bunt. Push towards the pitcher. Aiken's got it. Sacrifice bunt. Executed well. So Lewisburg very content to try to small ball this inning. Manufacture one more insurance run for the road and then hand the baseball over to their 6-3 closer. Ten runs now on ten hits. One air for Lewisburg. Three runs on six hits. Two airs for Purvis. Here's a bunt. Push back over to Aiken. And another sacrifice. Moving Brown to third, and they're now two away. Well, I didn't know just how prophetic my words were when I said that they were content to try to just manufacture one more. I thought there they might swing away. But now the runner at third, two outs. And here's Aaron Baker, bottom of the order in the nine spot here in the bottom of the sixth. Here's the pitch. Chopper on the infield. This should do it, but it's going to be a tough play at first. And Farrell makes it with Lambeth, and that ends the inning. So after this single, runner can't get home. 6-3 ground out ends the inning. No runs, a hit, no errors. One left on base. And we will head to the seventh for the exciting conclusion when we come back. It is Lewisburg 10, Purvis 3. Patriots three outs away from forcing a game three in this best of three series. We'll take a break. Back in a moment, you're watching the MHSAA Network. 
can get a player up here. Oh, that's good stuff. Wiley Ballard graphic. Do you want me to start the stream? Start the stream. Camera three. Beautiful. For more information on how your school can join the Play on School broadcast program and participate in the MHSAA network, go to playonsports.com slash SBP. It will start at the bottom of the lineup tonight for the Purvis Tornadoes here in the seventh. As leading things off will be the man that lasted only an inning in the third and is in danger of taking his third loss of the season and that is Chase Smith. Smith will bat in the, will bat in the eighth spot in the lineup followed by Nathan Roseberry and then it will be the top of the order in Philip Lott. But a 10 to three ball game and there you see the big 6-3 senior. As we watch him go through his warmups, there you see the separate comes from way underneath. 86 with a fastball over the top. So you're looking at all this stuff that is so hard to pick up on from down low then all of a sudden he's going to separate on you. We'll see it right here. Going to separate from shoulder high and then come over the top of the fastball at 86. Good luck, and that's why he's been their closer this year. And as we look at his numbers, I'm trying to pull his numbers very quickly. For Scholl, a 1.54 earn run average tops on the team. Opponents batting 270 against him. He's worked in 27 innings and a third of another. He's given up nine runs, six earned, 30 hits all year. For Scholl, he's looking for his 10th save on a day where his team has 10 runs on 10 hits. So if you think that's not meant to be, Scholl deals. So Scholl, a 2-0 record. This is his 25th appearance on the year. And here's a pop up to right field. Drifting in to put it away. In right field is Chris Taylor and there is one away. So Chase, Chase Smith flies out. Eight in a row retired by Patriot pitching and here comes Nathan Roseberry. Roseberry one for two, a single, a fly out to right and a run driven in. Here's the pitch and a check swing. Good decision that time by Roseberry. Well, we are looking like all signs pointed towards a game three. Here's one fair ball knocked down behind the bag at third. Throw across the diamond in time. Major league play by Aaron Baker hooking up with Tanner Lord on the stretch at first to rob Roseberry of a hit. And so an entire trip through the lineup set down in order by Patriot pitching. And here is Scholl, a pitch away from his 10th, well, what would have been his 10th save, just going to be an inning of relief to close it down, not a save situation. I got a little too excited when I saw that he had nine saves this year. But in his 25th appearance, what would have been his 10th save in a save opportunity, he's got 10 runs, 10 hits on the board. He doesn't need the save. He's got plenty of run support of seven as he comes inside and nearly catches Lot on the back of the calf. But it has been impressive what we have seen from the Patriots. Again, running one inside. And Lot's, that's twice now, he's lucky to have a kneecap left. He's very nonchalant, though, about it. I would have already dropped the bat and gone and taken up golf again. Here's a ground ball to second. It's probably going to do it. Haney's got it over to Lloyd, and we're going to game three. A dominating 10-3 win from the start for the Patriots, and the celebration begins. And so Lewisburg, three runs in the bottom of the first, five in the bottom of the second,
Those three in the bottom of the first were all they needed to at least send it to extras. Instead, they tack on seven more, win by seven, pounding out 10 hits this afternoon. The win goes to Jonathan Lindsay. He moves to nine and one of the year. The loss goes to Chase Smith. He falls to six and three. Great work by our truck once again. We'll be back here with you in just over an hour for game two between Oak Grove and Madison Central. So again, Lewisburg and Purvis, game three that will be on Monday to be determined. I'm Josh West saying so long from Smithville Stadium.